Welcome back to the Making Ideas Work podcast. Today, I'm blessed to be joined by Janet Bumpus, product coach. And actually, Janet, I was going to start to introduce you, but I think you're a much better person <laughs> to introduce yourself, if that's okay. Well, thank you, Spencer. I'm very excited to be here. Um, so as you said, my name is Janet and I am from San Francisco, Silicon Valley, where I was a part of three different startups. Uh, one went public. One was acquired by eBay PayPal back when they were one company, and uh, one crashed and burned hard. So if you see me flinch over here, that will probably be scars left over from that one. Uh, I came over to Europe about seven years ago, uh, and I now live in Amsterdam, and I, am, uh, I advise and coach and train um, scale-ups and uh, big companies as well. It's amazing to hear, A, that you've had some successes, but also that some failures. And I'm sure there's some deep learnings, hopefully not too traumatic, some of those learnings from that failure. Um, but also, also, I've been in a similar kind of boat. But what you do now is focus on kind of product advising and coaching. And I'm really interested to hear what product coaching is. What is it to you? What is it that you do? And how do you kind of add value or support organizations to improve their practices? Yeah. Um, so for me, for, as someone who's coming from Silicon Valley and working in Europe, what I see is how companies build products in Silicon Valley in Europe is kind of very, very different. And so I'm working with companies to help them build products kind of in the Silicon Valley way. So some of it is uh, just education that there is like a different way that we go about building products. And some of it then is coaching where I'm working with either founders or product managers um, when they have challenges and we sit down and think about like, how are we going to address those challenges? Uh, and some of it is uh, trainings. So I, all three. Um, the way I see that companies build products differently in Silicon Valley than in Europe. And again, it's not absolute. There's some like fantastic product companies here in Europe that are doing amazing work. Uh, and there's some companies in Silicon Valley that you're like, wow, what are you doing? <laughs> so uh, it is kind of like a spectrum, but I, so I, I'm speaking in generalities here. Um, but I think so how company, so I feel like if you're a company, you have a couple of choices about how you're going to make a decision uh, as to what to build next. You could be either uh, what we're going to call sales led or management led. And in that world view, um, you know, sales might come in and they'd be like, oh, I just closed a fantastic deal. Like this is going to be huge revenue for the company. Uh, it's a great deal. But you know what? To close the deal, I promised the customer that we would have a blue button on our website. <laughs> uh, so you over there in design and engineering, please go build me that blue button. Right. Um, or management come, I come in and be like, you know, I'm a VP or I'm, you know, someone really important. Uh, and in the shower this morning, I had this great idea, or I was talking to one of our investors and we came up with this great idea over the golf course. And I think we need a green button on the website. So, hey, design and engineering, go build me uh, that green button. And in that world, the role of, we don't need a product manager because the job of a product manager is both to uh, build a product that customers love to figure out a, a way to build that product in such uh, or a product that will make money for a business and then the delivery of that product. Um, and if management or sales is telling you what to build, you don't need to figure out what it is that you need to build, right? Like, so we can just have a product owner, which is an agile term, and focus on delivering that in world class, amazing ways using agile and, you know, Kanbans and retros and thinking about your product velocity. And all that sort of stuff that a product owner does. Um, it, in a so that's one way that we can be. Uh, another way that a company can make decisions is to be engineering led, right? Like engineers get together and they're like, "Oh my gosh, this is an amazing technology. We can build this. We can do it. Why? L let's do it, right?" I once I still remember I was working with an engineer, uh, and it, part of the project was rolling out a, fo a phone system. And it was going to be a voice over IP phone system. And so the engineer came to me and he's like, super excited. He's like, Janet, I've got this great idea. Do you know what we can do? 
we can have it so that you can call each other by using their IP address. So people can like enter in the IP address into the phone and dial somebody. Uh, and I'm like, who, who would want to do that? <laughs> like, I don't even know what my IP address like, Really? You want me to memorize that IP address? Like, no. Um, yeah. But, you know, there are some companies that are engineering led and they come up with products like Google Glass, I would say, is an example, or the Segway, like marvels of engineering. But like, do, does anybody use it, right? Um, a third way we can do it in this way is not so common is to be design led, right? Um, and uh, uh, many people think Apple is design led. Uh, I would argue that no, they're still building products that customers love. But like an example of a design led product might be something like Juicero, which I don't know. Do you remember mm, Juicero? It was that? I do. Yeah, the horror show story of that one. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. But it was like beautiful. It was gorgeous. Like the, like it, like you look at it, you put it on your countertop. You're like, that is a work of art, right? Yeah. yeah Meanwhile, yeah, yeah. it's like seven hundred bucks. It's over engineered and it breaks down and doesn't. Work. <laughs> so um so that's a third way so sales led management led engineering led design led uh the way silicon valley companies do it is uh we say we're going to be product led and uh there's some debate over this terminology because i feel like when people hear product led they're like oh does this mean the product manager is going to like become my boss and tell me everything um so some people are now saying the product model um but mm -hmm. here we have uh, management uh, setting, you know, determining what hard problems we are going to solve. And by a hard problem, it's not how do I get a blue button onto the screen. A hard bot problem is like, hey, can we reduce churn by 5% or can you increase, you know, customer acquisition by 15% or whatever it is. And then design, engineering and um, product work together. We call them the, the trio. Or uh, one company I worked with recently called them the Three Amigos, um, <laughs> which I thought was really cute. Uh, cute. They work together to figure out how to solve these hard problems. And then we need to have uh, not just continuous discover or delivery with our agile Kanban retro, but we also need to have continuous discovery where we're figuring out what it is that customers want to build or want and the, how we can make this in a way that's going to make our company money. Right. And so we're always learning on both of those fronts. Um, the I feel like the product model leads to products that not only I mean, they're better designed, like these products you see it come out of Silicon Valley. They're just like a glove, like they fit so well, they just work and do what you want them to do. And not only that, under the product model, you're more resilient and responsive. Right. Like you can. You see a customer opportunity and you can react and move fast. You don't have to go up the chain and back down the chain, right? Uh, the sales-led and management-led world tends to result in more tech debt. Uh, and uh, as you probably know, tech debt, that's the delta between if you built a product ideally, what your code base would be, and if you, uh, the code base that you actually have, right? So like if you can imagine if Google said we're going to throw out all our code and like rebuild it, what they rebuilt would probably be a little more elegant because what they have now is like a reflection of the winding path that Google has taken. Um, so, I mean, tech debt's a big thing. Like, you know, CTOs, maybe 30% of engineering's time is spent on tech debt, right? If it gets over 50% for too long, we, we're probably finding a new CTO, but uh if you're doing the sales led or the management led model, you end up with more tech debt because everything is ad hoc. You can't plan things out, right? You can't say, okay, I'm going to build out a structure for buttons that can be multiple colors every mm -hmm. day. You have to hard code in a new color, right? Um, so I try to teach people how to do it in the product led or product model way. Wow. Amazing. What a, what a, dis, uh, an explanation. I, I love that. And even just that first bit that you talked about there, I could almost hear the kind of audible agreements from people that might be listening about this, you know, this, um, this friction, this kind of being pulled in different directions, particularly if you're sales led or, or, you know, management led where you're, you know, the, the, the most important person or the highest paid person in the room comes in and says, we're going to do this thing today. Uh, the salesperson comes in. Yeah, but you know, the, the customer that we've just sold this to, they want this thing. And I've been in that situation as well. And it's incredibly difficult to navigate. The amount of people that I talk about or talk to 
that want to get out of that you know melissa uh, perry would talk about the build trap you know this idea of constantly building or indeed you know david bland who's been on the show as well talking about the the yeah that that kind of um the uh, what is it product death cycle i think he calls it of, you know, we don't have this thing people need this thing let's build this thing oh we don't have this you know this kind of cycle of never-ending build whereas actually what's really important and what you've kind of articulated there is is this this constant learning loop constant discovery and it kind of makes me think of, I saw some posts recently about, um, and I know that you're a practitioner in many different, you know, of uh, frameworks or methodologies, lean, design thinking, jobs to be done, agile, all these things. And people kind of starting to now go, you know, which comes first and what order do we do these, these things, trying to make sense of design thinking and lean and how they kind of mesh together. And I think the reality of it is that I think what we're coming I'm interested to hear your view actually on this. It feels like we're coming out the out of that now to a more of a product thinking world, which is proper meshing of these different frameworks in such a way as you don't you don't do design thinking and then hand over to development and run you know agile sprints. This is all intertwined. It's constant discovery, as you talked about, constant delivery constant deployment in order to learn as much as possible and continue to to build what people love and what people need right yeah yeah and um you know the product managers in silicon valley are some of the most overworked people out there because <laughs> i mean it's a lot like to do this uh you know it takes like four hours a day we want to see them involved in customer discovery and then they're doing the entire product owner's job and then you know you're a member of a company so you have to go to all hands meetings and do you know feedback and stuff like that uh so it's a lot and so people are like well can't you just split it and have one person do the customer discovery one do the delivery and it finds there's just so interwoven and there's so many connections that it kind of needs to sit in one person's brain um right. but i what you said actually um talking about sales uh, led and management led, um, people sometimes think that I don't like sales because I talk about this product model. I mean, that's not true. Like sales is unbelievably important. And you know what, if a client comes in with, you know, if they have a potential to bring in a huge deal, like we might want to build that blue button. Like we, that might be a great thing to do. Like again, you know, um, I just don't want, the sales to determine solely the roadmap. And I think the difference is salespeople are out there talking to customers all day long. It's just the the lens through which they're talking to customers is what do we need to do to close this deal in the next three months, right? Or six right. months, right? Whereas when the product people go out and talk to customers, they're saying, what do we need to do so that we can crush the market in three years time? And so you can imagine, like, over the long run, that set, that second view is going to end up with a better product, right, over the long run. Um, but, you know, you won't get to the long run if sales never closes a deal. So <laughs> we need them both, right? We need it all to work together. Absolutely. And actually what you talked about right at the beginning was the importance of the decision. And decision-making is probably an art and a science. And actually I think a lot of what, product people do is i mean we're making decisions constantly all the time but actually with something like that where you've got a big client that wants something making the decision for the right reasons and knowing what you're saying no to is probably as as important as what you're saying yes to right if you say yes to one big thing then you're saying no to a lot of other things and 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 i think the importance and of this is like that openness and the conversation that can happen around that in order to make sure that you're making you know, that right yes and the right no's ultimately. Yeah, I 100% agree. Absolutely. So look, I'm, I know that you're, you've got a new course coming out and we'll do a, a quick plug now, but we'll definitely do a bigger plug for it later on as well. So a new course coming out on Maven. Um, we'll get some dates about that down in the description and all the links and everything else for anyone that wants to go and check this out. It's about building better products. It's called Build Better Products. Like, what does that mean? What's the secret, if there is a secret of building better products, you know, maybe what's the process or what are the kind of key things that you're covering maybe in that course, a little sneak preview maybe <laughs> of some of that stuff. Um, what is it, what does that really mean? And, yeah. and, and how do people start to think about building better products? 
So the class is targeted at uh, frontline product managers, uh, practitioners who are out there trying to build products. Because, um, I mean, there is a big component of this that has to do with product leadership, setting your product vision and things like that. Uh, but this class is really for the practitioner who's out there, you know, in the trenches trying to figure out how, how to build a better product. Um, and as you mentioned before, like I, um, there's a lot of different tools that you can use, design thinking, lean startup, jobs to be done, like so many different tools. Uh, and so we're talking about like how to go about and looking at all these different tools. And I, I'm a believer of like, you know, there's some people who are like, it is jobs to be done. And that is the only thing that we should ever think about. Right. I just look at it as another tool in my tool belt. And I'm always blending and saying in this situation, what would be, what is it that I need to learn? And what is my best tool to figure out how to learn it? Um, I kind of started in this pathway. I, I remember when I was working at the company that got bought by eBay PayPal. This was about uh, 2007. And um, at that point, like Lean Startup was just starting, right? Like it was just like little whispers on the edge. Like it really wasn't uh, very popular then. Agile, the Agile Manifesto had come out in 2001. So that was starting to really right. gain speed. Uh, and at that point, the head of engineering, this great guy called Julio, uh, one day sat me down and he's like, Janet, I can build a product in world-class ways. Like I will build, whatever you tell me to build, I will build it. Like and it will be done well. It will use agile, Kanban, retros, pair programming, stories, points. Like I can do this. The problem here is you can't tell me what to build. Uh, which I have to say kind of stung, uh, <laughs> probably because he was right. <laughs> and you don't want the head of engineering to tell me like, to tell you that, that. painful truth. <laughs> yeah. Because at the time, the way we made decisions was there was like a couple of us on the leadership team and we would sit around once a week and we would say like, Hey, I think we need this. And like, whoever was most persuasive or whatever we do it. And like, we rarely talk to customers. Uh, and so that kind of set me on a path to figure out like, how do we know what we want to build, right? And it's an amazing, like it's puzzles, one part science, one part art, like you're figuring it out, it's a learning journey. Uh, and so I've pretty much for the last like 15 years, uh, that's kind of what I've been focusing on and figuring out uh, how do we know uh, what to build. Um, and so, yeah, that's what we're gonna be looking at in the class. So this is the culmination of your 15 years of experience in both successful, but also things that you again, picked up along the way and with those failures perhaps as well. Um, and I guess where, where does it, where does it start? Where does, you know, if there was a process, cause I, I think I'd love to be able to paint this picture of, you know, it's a five step process. And, and I think this is why things like design thinking, are accessible in some ways at least the fundamentals are very accessible the the process is accessible if not the philosophy if you like the, the higher thing about about things like this but but where where does where does building a project a great product um start i guess yeah. with the customer and actually that? i would start with having a really strong product vision uh and a product vision is how what is the impact that you want to have on a customer in their life? Like what change in customer behavior do you want to see in the world? Uh, and, you know, some people are like, oh, we have a really strong vision. We want to be number one in the marketplace. We want to have 10% revenue growth. And you've got like, so those are like impacts that you have as the side result of doing a good business. I am talking about what, what impact do you want to have on a customer's life? And then we can figure out like, what product do we need to build in order to have that impact? And I always say, like, if we can do it with two features, that's better than doing it with five, right? Like, let's, so we want to think about, and this is the whole world of thinking about outcomes versus output. Mm. Um, but it starts with a really strong product vision. Um, and one of the things that I've been doing lately with customers is, or clients, is a product vision sprint. Um and here at the end of it is kind of a combination of a design sprint, which you've been doing podcasts on that, yep. <laughs> and uh, a little bit of product, man product thinking and some storytelling skills. 
Uh, and at the end of it, we come up with a uh, kind of like a cartoon uh, uh, that takes us through like slide by slide. What do we think the the ideal customer journey? We set it like three to five years out. And I mean, if you're software and fast moving, maybe it's a little bit closer in. If you're a hardware or slower moving business, maybe you want to think a little bit further out. And we say, okay, what is that story? Um, and we do, I love doing it in a week for all the benefits that you know well that a design sprint brings. Um, in the end, you know, a classic design sprint or Google design sprint ends with, you know, an experiment that we run with customers here. Our end is we take the product vision that we've created and show it to some stakeholders or some big customers and get their feedback. So there's that moment of truth at the end where you have to kind of show your work. Um, it's interesting. So the way the, 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 the storyboarding way of putting out the product vision started, uh, I think it's a fun story. So back in the 1930s, the Walt Disney Company, uh, they made the first feature-length animated film, which was Snow White. Mm -hmm. And this was a big, risky bet for the company. Like, no one had ever done it. It took a ton of money, right? And it was this big new process to do a full-length feature animated film. Uh, and so pretty soon, all the designers, like it was so much that everyone was kind of getting lost. And so Walt Disney came up and he made a storyboard. And that was the first time that you would see. And now we see them all the time in movies, like they get storyboards to walk us through the movie. Uh, but that was the first time. Uh, and then back in 2011, uh, Brian Chesky, one of the co-founders of Airbnb, uh, was on his Christmas vacation and he was reading a book and he read the biography of Walt Disney. Uh, and when he came back, uh, at that point in time, Airbnb was like three years old. Like they had maybe like something like a million uh, nights booked. So they were up and running, right? But like they, they were still like a small early, you know, like success was not guaranteed. Uh, and so the executive team was sitting around uh, trying to figure out what should we do next, right? What hard problem should we solve next? And there were a lot of different things. Like maybe we need to get more inventory. Maybe we need to like product extensions. We could go into, you know, renting offices or renting cars or other things like that. Maybe should we look at mobile, um, which this was like, you know, 2011, like less than half of Americans had a smartphone, right? And it wasn't the force that it was, to, you know, the natural, but of course everything has to be mobile today. And so they said, hey, let's take this technique storyboards that Walt Disney used and see if we can apply it here. And so they did a storyboarding process and uh, they even hired in, uh, I mean, this is one of the blessings of being in Silicon Valley where Pixar is as well. They got a designer from Pixar to come in and the storyteller. So like, as you do. <laughs> I know, like I, I would love to work with a Pixar storyteller. <laughs> that would be fantastic. But they storyboarded out what, like in three to five years, what do they think the ideal customer version, like experience would be with Airbnb? Uh, and they realized through doing this process that a lot of it happened outside of the website. Like the experience happens when it's like 11 p.m. at night and you show up at the door and you can get the key, right? Or all these things, or you show up at the door and you realize, oh, there's five flights of stairs and there's no elevator and I have a big suitcase. Like these are things that are impacting your experience. Uh, and so what came out of it is like, oh, we need mobile. Right. Like, because when you show up the door at 11 p.m., if you can't figure out the key, you're you're traveling. You don't have a computer. You don't have Wi-Fi. Right. You need mobile. Uh, and so they made that decision and it turned out to be the right decision. And by like, you know, the end of the year, like a quarter of their traffic came in through mobile. Um, so and since then in Silicon Valley, like more and more startups have been using this like it's spread and now it's spread around the world. And it's a really powerful technique uh, to have a strong product vision. Uh, cause I find, um, uh, it, like, you know, when you're doing product prioritizations, you've got 15 ideas out there, which one should you do? Having a product vision makes it very clear. Like, oh yeah, we need to be doing that one. <clears throat> Absolutely. I love that, that direction, but I also love the element of storytelling with that as well. And like, there's so many times that I come back to the power of storytelling through the work that I do because it can yeah just it just conveys what you're trying to say often you know we default less so these days but pre previously probably defaulted to you know a powerpoint or a keynote you know loads of bullet points on a slide and all this kind of heavy jargon based data and facts 
We love right. that. Little, yeah. But actually the power of the story is where, where the messages can get conveyed in such a way that people, it kind of resonates with the head and the heart, right? It kind of hits people where they need to be hit, if you like, and really gets people on board with, with that direction of travel, why we're here can motivate as well as, as well as give that direction as well. And I think, um, gives you that, that sense of purpose, I think as well. So I think there's so many benefits, right. To something like that. I agree. Like, I feel like the world doesn't change because of data and facts. It changes because we have a new story. Uh, right. and so it's bringing the story for it. And it's also visual. Uh, I think the brain will process information like 60,000 times faster, uh, with images than it does with words. So images, yeah. and I've seen some companies when they do this, so they take the final storyboard and they have, you know, like different pictures and they hang it on their lobby wall. Like when people come in, cause it's such a great communication tool, uh, to share the story. So sharing it even beyond your staff and stakeholders, but actually just making it visual. I think that's amazing as well. I'm going to definitely be stealing that idea with some of the people that I, I work with as well. And also I think just, just to kind of dwell for a minute, because in this fast paced world that we're in and you've got things being thrown at you left, right, and center, actually having a, having a moment to look and to visualize what the future could be for those customers. And uh, again, just to kind of emphasize this point about this product vision is, is about the behavior change that you want customers to go through. It's that change in behavior that you're looking to seek. And I think having that, that moment to look, you know, way beyond the period that we would normally look at, right? Because we don't want to be making business plans for three or five years at a time. But what we do want to be doing is visualizing what the future of our customer could look like when, and the behaviors that, that change and where we ultimately, where we are our product or where our company kind of fits into that journey for them is the important part of that, I guess. And I 100% agree. It's, yeah. Uh, and I also think it's very, it, it's helpful to scale, to have a strong, it helps you scale. Because like, if you want to scale, you can either do it, I only know two ways, you could do it with people or you could do it with process. Right. Uh, and I don't know too many people who wake up and go to work and say like, gosh, I really hope someone layers a heck of a lot of process on top of what I'm doing. <laughs> and like, micromanages me and gives me checklists and like rules and all sorts of stuff like this. Like nobody wants that. We all want to be on an empowered team, right? Where we can sense in the market what is an opportunity, quickly respond to it, build a product that customers love. Like that, like that's what we want to be doing. But if mm. you're a company and you have 10 product teams, right? And everybody's empowered and running in their own direction, you're you're not going to go in one, like all orders are not going to be going the same way, right? One person's going to be going that way. One's going to be going that way. So the strong product vision allows you to empower your teams because if everybody has it in their head, like, oh, we're trying to hit point A and here's how I can make a contribution to that and get us a little bit closer to that, then they're empowered to make those decisions. Um, it was really impressive. Like I was listening to a podcast recently with uh, interviewing two people from LinkedIn, right? Mm -hmm. It's a great podcast. But I was so impressed. So LinkedIn, uh, they want to like, uh, I can't remember what their vision is. It's something around like creating economic opportunity for every member in the workforce, right? Uh, and it was impressive in the podcast, like how much, like everything they said related back to that. They referenced that like so many times, like that was in their head um, and in their hearts as well. Like it's the mm. strong product vision is your number one recruiting tool. Like everybody wants to have an impact in the world and know what is my impact and something I can get behind. Uh, and it's just that that is a great, I mean, so I would rather scale via empowered teams uh, than process. And the way to do it is a strong product vision and a couple other things. Amazing. Maybe we'll come back to those other things, but there's two points I want to make. Uh, I want to just uh, pick up on that one as well. The first thing is that, um, you know, we've talked about this product vision f to enable the product team to have that direction setting and, and to be able to work out you know, the strategy and the tactics and what you're going to build ultimately following down from that kind of cascading from that. But there's this bigger piece as well, as you just talked about and highlighted there with this LinkedIn podcast is that it permeates throughout the rest of the organization that 
then your marketing effort and then your salespeople, then your people that are doing podcasts for you are all going in that same direction. So it becomes, it becomes part of you. It becomes part of what you're talking about. I remember being in a part of an amazing uh, startup, early, early stage of a startup. I was the, the product director, but we were very sales led at that point. So it's a bit of a challenging one, but we were so committed and understood the organization so well. I used to talk about this. Maybe this is a bit of a kind of a, uh, a UK centric thing. I'm not too sure, but you know, like sticks of rock, they're like candy, the candy that you get at, at um, Oh, uh, those are this, very fun. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So you get these sticks of candy and if you break them in half, often there's a word of the place that you're at. So there's like Brighton beach or there's like Margate or something, which is kind of inside these, these sticks of candy or sticks of rock. I'll get some pictures of it maybe up so we can understand this for anyone who's not seen this stuff before, but I used to kind of joke about, you know, if you cut people in half, they say the name of the company and the product vision inside, inside their, you know, their body. it's a flippant kind of thing, but, but that's the kind of point that you want to get to, I think. Uh, and which leads me to this conversation about culture. And this is, you know, again, a, maybe a bit of a curveball for us, but, I'm interested to know your view on the, the the difficulties of changing culture, because what I think we're talking about here is really comes down to a changing culture, right? If you're sales led and you want it to be, a, to be more product led, that's not just changing a few methods. It's not just slapping on a bit of design thinking on what you do. It's changing people fundamentally what they think and what they believe and changing great, often big groups of people to change that as well. Then, um, interested to hear your yeah. know, your view on that your struggles maybe or, or yeah. success about that as well um so it's funny because the, uh, the lean startup started in about 2007 eight ish we were talking before and like yeah. i feel like lean startup is here in europe like it's like everybody's running experiments like that has gotten embedded in companies this whole product model uh I mean, I think it really started in the 90s with a company Intuit was one of the early adopters. And then a big mover on this was Google, Apple, and Facebook. They all started adopting this. And you can see they've been rather successful with it. And uh, uh, then, you know, people from those companies go and found another company or they become a VC and they coach their companies that way. And so they, they kind of grew up with this, right? But so... Why has Lean Startup shown up here in Europe and this product model really hasn't so much? And I, I would actually, I don't have the answer. I would love to have some, uh, if any of your listeners or you have any theories, I would love to learn because I'm trying to figure this out myself. But I do think one of the things is it's really easy to implement Lean Startup. As an executive, you could be like, yeah, all you teams go over there and do Lean Startup, but that's not threatening me. Like I'm still going to be making decisions the way I've made decisions, right? Whereas this requires senior management to actually fundamentally change what they do. And it's funny, uh, Marty Kagan, who runs the Silicon Valley product group and is kind of one of the lead thinkers in this, his first book was empowered, or excuse me, inspired. And it was targeted at frontline product managers of how to build a product that's inspired. Uh, and he did that and all the product managers are like, it's great, I'm trying to do this, but my boss keeps telling me what to build. So then he wrote a second book uh, called Empowered which is for product leaders saying like, how do I get an empowered team? Uh, and now he's just come out or he's coming out with a third book, Transformed, which is kind of like, okay, you're an executive and this is a big company at answering just that question because it is hard and it is tough uh, to do, but uh, it is possible. <laughs> yeah, and we've seen it. We've seen it. There are some amazing examples of people that have changed or have applied these things. I think you're right. Like. If, if that's your hypothesis of, you know, the reason why it's working in Silicon Valley, it's adopted much more in Silicon Valley or, or the US more broadly, as opposed to, to, to Europe. I think, I think I see this as well. I think I see that there is a, a desire often at the lower end in the product management, product manager kind of roles. There's a desire to be, to be product led. There's a, pro, a desire to, you know, have much more, um, I was going to say control. I don't mean control in, the, in a kind of an overbearing way, but control of the direction that you're going in and making sure that you're kind of fulfilling that that vision, that that, that ultimate direction that you want to get to. But it hits often a, I often think of the middle management, that kind of, you know, 
been here for a long time that maybe lifers in an organization they are there and this is not it's going to sound maybe derogatory but their main existence is kind of survival i want to just stay here if i like like no one what was it no one um no one gets fired hiring ibm that kind of like it's just something that you do that you and actually i do know some people that have been fired uh, after hiring ibm more recently but hey that's another conversation altogether but it's a it's a very difficult barrier to kind of penetrate with anything new because they you know you hear these things don't you like that's not how things are done here we tried that before you know those kind of things oh design thinking we did that but it didn't work um or, or whatever and so you have this really impenetrable um immune system uh which is kind of built to fight off the new and often people think this is just something new it's kind of maybe it's it's uh uh you know it's a fad it's a trend that people that isn't going to or, or whatever reason but i think that cultural change is so difficult i actually find sometimes i'm not sure whether you feel this as well but you often get um motivation from people you know at the lower end and you get motivation from people that are the very top so often ceos and c-suites they want these changes they talk about you know broadly about agility about moving fast about the voice of the customer about the importance of getting close to what the problems that customers are really trying to solve but it breaks down somewhere and it's almost like that's that middle just kind of immune system kicks in and kind of fights off fights off uh this new fandangled sparkly stuff that yeah. doesn't, <laughs> doesn't seem and to work i love how Teresa torres put it she says meet people where they're at right because right. you're right there and it's like it's not about going black and white like one day we were sales led and the next day we turn around and we're product led uh it's like little steps like what can you do to make you one step closer right and like and that's great like maybe you're you know, development cycle is five years. Can you bring it down to four? Like, okay, just a little yeah. bit better. So yeah. um, it's funny. I The case that brought me to Amsterdam originally was uh, I embedded with Philips into a uh, one of their product teams uh, for the One Blade, which is a male shaving device. I don't know. Do you use the One Blade? Have you heard of it? I, I don't. I don't shave generally. I haven't shaved to bit of information for you probably unnecessary but i haven't shaved since i was 18 17 or really? 18 yeah no, oh that must time. be lovely <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah it's it's largely driven by laziness i assure you yeah because I, I i it's funny like me being on a male grooming team like i it's not an area that i have a natural like understanding of but i do learn that men spend a lot of time with male grooming on facial hair um yeah. But so anyway, so Philips had developed this product and they spent many years, many, many, many years developing it. And uh, they millions and millions of dollars behind developing it. It was a new technology uh, and they brought it out to market and their lead customer that was going to uh, deliver or be their sales channel was Walmart. And Philips and Walmart have a great relationship. Uh, and when they gave it to where they're getting ready to give it over to Walmart to sell, Walmart's like, we love you, Philips, you know that. But we do have to do this test called Basis 2. Uh, it's just a test of how much customers are going to buy it. Uh, and the product actually failed the Basis 2 test, which if, and so Walmart's like, sorry, we're not taking it. Which if you're a company who's just spent years developing something and millions and millions of dollars on it, like that wow. is a not good moment. <laughs> and this is a moment where people are starting to lose their jobs. And like, and so I think it was, uh, and this was back like, you know, seven years ago. Um, so they're like, okay, like they're kind of backs against the wall. And they said, let's try this crazy thing, lean startup and see if it can help us. And so we were given six months. I was put on a team and we used these new techniques uh, and it actually worked. And we brought it back to Walmart and it passed the Basis 2 test. Uh, and I just read recently, so this is like about five years after launch, uh, they announced they sold 100 million blades. Which this wow. being a razor, like it is a razor blade model, right? Like that's what you need to do is sell the blades. So it's a huge success. And Phillips is now like touting, oh, uh, you know, we disrupted the market with our new, thing, right? And it's a huge success for them. But what the interesting thing is, not just with that one product, pretty soon every other team was like, hey, I, I want to do what the one blade team did. And if you got that one like easy success story in your company, then other people are like, wait, wait, they just had a massive success. What did they do? Uh, and that really like shifted things bigger in the culture. Uh, 
And I remember I, I think it was like a year I spent doing like trainings at Phillips and working with coaching and working with teams. Uh, and you know, Phillips is so big and you're working with like, you know, two people at a time, 10 people at a time. And you're like, am I, is this really making a difference? And it wasn't until like, it was like a year later, someone came to me and be like, Hey, I have an idea for a product, but instead of building it first, I want to figure out if the market wants it. I was like, oh. And this is a person I'd never talked to before. (laughs) You're like, something's (laughs) happening. Um, So it is a long, hard, slow process. Um, Christian, who works with Marty Kagan at the Silicon Valley Product Group, he once said uh, when he starts to, and he does these big transformation efforts, right? Uh, He says when he starts with a company, uh, he sits down with the CEO and he says, what are you willing to change? And if the answer is anything less than everything, he's like, you're not ready because it is everything that has to change. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I work with product managers, helping them build better products because I don't think I have the patience for <laughs> <laughs> the personality to handle, to tackle that one. <laughs> it's yeah, but that's such an interesting perspective. And it's something I believe in, in the organization, but I also believe this from a personal perspective as well. If you, you know, and I kind of relate this a lot to some of the changes that I've gone through personally in the last five, six years, probably I've kind of just, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know quite why I'm going down this route, but I think it's an interesting one is that I kind of redesigned my life using kind of a product thinking approach, right. And the way that I eat, how I exercise my relationships, uh, how I work, how I want to work. And I kind of went through all of these um, and yeah, kind of got a vision. I worked backwards from that to come up with different strategies, experimented along the way. So for anyone that was kind of taking track of my diet over a couple of years ago, it's looked like I was doing every single fatty diet there was just to kind of go through a period of experimentation and exploration to figure out what is working for me and what my body does. Um, but uh but I had to change everything, right? And I think that's the key thing. If you want to change something big like that, you've got to change everything. So I can totally relate to it on a personal level, but I see this in organizations. I think you need to well. do a podcast on all the personal changes you made and how you applied this I, to your own life. You know that's what? I amazing. should definitely do that. Yeah. I mean, one of the biggest moments for me was I created a personal manifesto. I call it that. Um, like these these policies, if you like, that I stuck to. And some silly things, you know, like I would... I would always be at home on a Friday evening to have dinner with my kids. We'll watch a film or whatever, but I'll never do anything work-based on a Friday, which means that weekends are basically, you know, there was one time I was working for a company um, and, um, and they wanted to do a, a, a leadership retreat over the weekend. And I just kind of put my hand up and said, Hey, look, my, my personal policy says that I've got to be at home. It's like, it's part of my policy. Like it's a part of my manifesto. I can't, change that it's like it's my policy it's my thing uh and then they switched it to being like leaving on the sunday and getting on the getting back on the tuesday or whatever it was but it 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 meant that you have you can have a different conversation rather than like i kind of want to be at home rather than being away like it's a part of who i am and how i live like that's an important thing for me and it kind of changes the conversation completely I am sure that everybody else who was supposed to be at that retreat was so thankful that you spoke up (laughs) because I I feel like everybody wants to have their weekend, but like, it's really hard to say that. And so, yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it completely changed everything that I do. It's, it changed some of these kind of compounding habits as well, you know, like, or like decisions that you make that you, you, you make the decision once and you never have to make it again. I would always take these stairs instead of an, instead of an elevator, if I could see the top. If I can see the top, I'll take the stairs. I'll never take the elevator. You know, if I can walk it in half an hour, I'll take a walk instead of taking public transport. These silly, easy to do things, but once you make a decision like that, it just becomes a fundamental part of who you are. And like, Beautiful. yeah, thank you. That's kind of nice to share that, but I would definitely do a yeah a bigger piece about that some other some other time perhaps. <laughs> um, I was going to say, so uh, I have some other theories about why this product model uh, took root in Silicon Valley and has not yet, as to the degree, taken root uh, here in Europe. Uh, right. Which is not a hundred percent right. There are some companies here in Europe who are doing amazing work. Um, yeah, and I again, I'm back in the world of hypothesis. Like I'm trying to figure this out myself. I find it like a very interesting question. Like why is it so different? 
Uh, so again, if you have any thoughts or insights or your listeners do, I would love to hear that. But so one is it's a lot harder than lean startup. Then mm-hmm. another one is, um, uh, I think people like you have to kind of be exposed to it. Uh, and so London, where you're at, they have a lot more product led stuff because I feel like there's a lot of traffic going between the U S and the UK. Like if an American's going to come to Europe, highest probability is they're going to end up in London. Right. Cause it, the language and we just, you know, we all yeah. want to be like King Arthur and all those stories. Like those are the stories we heard as kids. Right. Uh, yeah. And I think- I think that's right. I think from from my perspective on 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 London, it feels like a, a very fast follower. It feels like nothing kind of gets invented here, but we see what's happening across the pond and, and very quickly try to apply that and adapt to to those new new ideas. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah, and so here in the Netherlands, it was funny. I I was with a group of about 20 founders and the, whoever was running the product. And it was like product day for this uh, scaling support program. Uh, and I asked them who had heard of Marty Kagan, uh, which is a kind of my baseline question. Like if you haven't heard of Marty Kagan, you probably have not heard of the product model or product like companies. Right. Uh, and one out of 20 hands went up. So uh, I was like, okay, wow. we have to go to ground zero <laughs> and start and there. This was a, pro- this was a, a product. Mm-hmm. These were like the founders and like the head of product or whoever was running wow. product. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and it was like six months ago. So <laughs> um, not a long time ago. Um, and it's interesting. So I think like Stockholm has an amazing product scene as well. And I think it all revolved around Spotify, which was. Uh, became such a big influence in the Stockholm scene. But if you look at the founder of Spotify, uh, one, he had a previous exit, so he had his own money. Uh, so he could kind of tell the venture capitalists to back off. And I, and I think there's a big difference the way venture capitalists fund in the US and also in the UK and the way they're funding in Europe. I joke that venture capitalists in Silicon Valley, they're investing on a dream, right? Whereas venture capitalists in Europe are investing on profit. Right. Mm. And you get a much bigger amount of money in the US, which uh, allows you to set that three year product vision and like let you say, okay, I'm going to work towards this. It also lets you, you know, we do a lot of silly things in product in, in, or in Silicon Valley. And you, I feel like investors are figuring out now that all that money might not always be good. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, uh, I once, uh, there is a Wilson Sonsini lawyer who's amazing and he works with European startups, bringing them to the U S and he said, uh, the ideal company would have American ambition with European discipline. Uh, cause right. yeah. we sometimes mess up, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. but so they have a lot less money. The VCs in Europe are giving a lot less money and they're really putting pressure on like, you got to get profit, get to profitability. Uh, which pushes you down a sales-led path, right? And that's an early decision that a company takes in order to survive because this is what the environment that they're in. And then all of a sudden we have sales and management making all the decisions and having that being your existing power structure. Whereas it's different and a different in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, so in Stockholm, the founder there had his own money uh, so he could tell the VCs to back off a little bit. Uh, and again, there are some wonderful VCs in Europe that are doing wonderful work. Uh, so I don't want to make a blanket statement. But the second thing with Spotify is he's personal friends with Mark Zuckerberg. So he kind of understood what they were doing. So he had the exposure. Uh, yeah. So some of it is just kind of like, you know, the path dependency, like where things happened and came up. Um, yeah. I find it interesting. Berlin is the home of Rocket Internet, who is like the nemesis of Silicon Valley because like Silicon Valley spends all this time creating these beautiful companies and Rocket's like, we're just going to copy that and make a ton of money, <laughs> which brilliant business model. But so that influence, like that got so big in Berlin that that's kind of their perception on how to build a company. Um, so the path to spendency. It's super yeah. interesting. And it feels, it feels also like the, the exit model of vc funded companies is different as well in that in the us it's obviously big bets for 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 one or two big returns for kind of small numbers but big returns for for kind of small number of the of the portfolio whereas over here it feels like 
people have more of a willingness to sell earlier. So they might be consumed by a, you know, a big, like bought basically rather than IPO. So I think the tendency is to go, you know, to sell for multiple millions rather than kind of aiming for that unicorn status yeah. often as well, which is kind of an interesting thing as well. I 100% agree. And like, I get it. Like if you're a founder who's spent, you know, five, 10 years, like tons of work, putting your heart and soul and building this company and like, you know, not having your weekends, like everything all in, right? Take a huge risk and someone offers you a life-changing amount of money. Say, hey, I'll give you 10 million bucks. Like you can walk away right now with $10 million. Like that's a life-changing amount of money. You could Shoot. never work a day again spend your weeks by a house by the beach, like spend every day with your kids. Like that's a beautiful life. Right. And let's mm. be honest, if you get $10 million, you've kind of won at the game of life. Like I know money doesn't equal happiness, but like, gosh, darn it. It can buy you a lot of the trappings of happiness. Right. Like, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. There. And so it's kind of like a strange person who's going to say like, no, I'm all <laughs> in and I want to bet that I'm going to go to a hundred million. Right. Um, and some of those people who make that bet walk away with nothing. Like it is a risk, right? Like you can do it. So uh, that says a lot about for the ecosystem effects though, because if you have people who've walked away with a hundred million and they're now becoming investors and advising companies and stuff like that, they've got money that they're putting into the system. They've de you've got all of a sudden engineers and designers and product people who understand what's it like to scale from 10 million to 20 million users to 100 million users like and those skills get developed as well uh whereas i feel like europeans take the much more like logical like i don't know if i was offered that choice 10 million dollars to walk away right now i'd be like hmm. i'm gone <laughs> right <laughs> it's, it's the logical thing to do so it's kind of this aberration of, of, you know, highly ambitious people that ended up in Silicon Valley or like, I'm all in, let's go for a hundred. Absolutely. I wonder as well, that makes me think, I wonder if I, I get this sense that, you know, as culture changes as well, that we are far more tuned in to what happiness really is. And actually it's way more than just money. Although, as you say, you're winning at the, at the at the game of work in that in that instance, of course. Like financial security can often, I think, once people understand other elements of happiness, um, the where am I getting to this? I'm getting to this from from the perspective of I wonder whether that will change even more to the root of people selling earlier because of just wanting seeing seeing that you know retiring at fifty and spending some time with your kids and grandkids actually that might be a really nice thing to do. And I think people are more appreciative of what things might make them happy. And actually that money is just a kind of a fuel to enable that, that kind of contentment and happiness to start to happen as well. We can only help that the hope that the millennials will save us all. <laughs> They've hopefully yeah. got this figured out. Your experience of working in startups and in kind of multinational organizations or corporates, um, I guess, how does that differ? Um, what's your preference do you still work with both i know that you've you kind of come from a originally way back a kind of a big consultancy background as well with um boston consulting group and you've had the startup kind of experience and now you're in this world of doing both i think is that yeah. right mm -hmm. cool. yeah and i find like some of the challenges are the same like you have to do your customer discovery work like that's not different in a big corporation than it is in a startup um some of the environmental things are kind of different. Uh, uh, so, for example, like the startup that I that I worked at that uh, that was acquired by eBay and PayPal. Like PayPal actually started eBay and then you know shipped it over to PayPal and then the two companies split. Um, but PayPal shut it down eventually. And it, at that point in time, like the company, the little initiative had grown and we had like a million. Uh, dollars moving through the platform, which if you're an independent company, like that's venture capitalists start to get really excited. Yeah. And yet eBay and PayPal or PayPal at that time shut it down. Uh, and the reason being, if you look at the combined revenue of those two companies, it was close to $10 billion a year, right? So if you're a manager and you're trying to say, okay, I want to grow at 10, 20%, like I need to find a billion or two of revenue a year, right? Uh, and You've got this little initiative over here making a million, you know, doing a million in revenue, right? And 
at, that's just not enough to validate the, you know, to be worthwhile of the management attention. <laughs> so they shut it down, right? Yeah. Um, so there's some different things. Like you've got some great benefits of being like a new sassy little initiative in a large corporation. Like one, they made payroll every two weeks, which let me tell you, that's huge, right? Yeah. You have all sorts of resources, connections. They can help you. They can, you know, give you distribution. There's great stuff like that. There is this like little schism of difference. Um, I remember, so the first company that I worked in, a large company trying to, you know, jumpstart initiatives, they had a little internal accelerator. Uh, and we had like a couple of companies or initiatives in there that were kind of trying to do this lean startup, move fast, break things, like go fast. Uh, and I'm there, you know, talking to customers, we're building stuff, uh, and it never even occurred to me. But one day I got a call from legal, uh, and they, so I kind of got hauled down to legal's office, which like, that is never the way you want to start a relationship, <laughs> being called in there for doing something wrong. Uh, and so I'm in there in legal's office, like I'm tap dancing, like being like, well, let me tell you what we're doing here, you know. It's this little product and we're going to sell it for 20 bucks a unit and we're going to do three rounds of experiments and the first round, this, second round, that, and the third round, we actually want to sell 500 units. Uh, and the woman from legal looked back to me and she's like, oh, you mean 500,000? At, at which point there was a very awkward pause in the conversation, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> um, from her perspective, like, you know, 500 units at 20 bucks each, like what? that's not even like the coffee budget for a day for this company, right? <laughs> like it's such a small amount. And so there's this kind of schism, like there's, you know, you need to think on such a large scale when you're going with a company that's, you know, billions of dollars in revenue, you've got to be able to prove that you can get there and be a player in that very quickly. Uh, meanwhile, there's like all sorts of politics and other stuff that you have to manage, right? And on top of that, you have to do what a startup does is figure out a customer, you know, build a product that customers love and makes money for your company. Like you're, you're working really hard and all those things. So it's actually um, quite challenging. It's in a different environment and you can see how people yeah. need different skills and different uh, approaches. That's incredible. What a story. I, I, I hadn't really thought about that directly, you know, that orders of magnitude difference in terms of what success might look like, but also I wonder whether that translates, and this is maybe something just to, to think, to ponder on for the future, but, um, you know, I wonder how, how that translates to the way that you design experiments as well. Like, should should those experiments be be about selling 500,000 units? Or is it, does that, that you know, find 10, co co 10 people, 10 customers that love what you do, is mm -hmm. that still relevant when you're talking about those kinds of scale? That kind um, of scale? I, I do think it is relevant. Uh, I mean, and that, that's how we started with the Phillips One Blade that ended up selling 100 million blades. So you have to, I think it comes back to, you have to have the skill of telling a very good story if you're there, because you have to realize like, in a corporation, you're so small. Like you're, you know, running five, selling 500 units means nothing to these people, right? But you have to be able to tell the story of like, listen, this is a journey and this is what we're doing. And, you know, we're going to get to 100 million. Uh, and you have to show some wins that prove that you're on that path, right? A story backed by data. Uh, but it's storytelling. Yeah. And being that. very politically savvy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. That's a big one for the corporate world, for sure. Yeah. I love that we came full circle there back to storytelling as well as being a central, central element of all of this. It's the way to really, really drive, uh, drive what it is that you need to be able to do and drive, um, drive success forward, I think. Um, well, Janet, thank you so much. It's been an amazing conversation. I, I had high expectations. I should say, if anyone's still listening, um, Janet sent over, um, if you don't mind me saying this, Janet, sure. <laughs> uh, sent over a, an amazing um, list of things that we wanted to talk about. I sent over a couple of questions and Janet came back with this like pages and pages of stuff. And we've probably covered like less than 50%. I probably <laughs> of this thing, right? Um, there's so much more that we could, we could unpack. So maybe we'll do a, a round two sometime, uh, which would be amazing. I am an over-preparer and uh, <laughs> so like I dive deep into things when I'm thinking about something and like, this is where good customer development comes in. You're like, all right, let's understand everything. <laughs> I love that. I love that about you. And uh, it is, uh, it, it's credit to the conversation because I think that preparation really helps with this. Um, final, final things I want to leave people with is um, 
where can people find out more about you, uh, about what it is that you do, maybe your Maven course, but also um, I know that you're going to talk a little bit about LinkedIn. I've, I've got a very quick anecdote about the, your LinkedIn work, particularly your carousels on pricing recently have been absolutely incredible. I've been watching. I actually went back through some posts uh, the other day because I saw something and it changed the conversation that I was having with my uh, co-founder, my partner, about how we price things directly as a result of seeing what you had done. So I went back through all of those um, other carousels on pricing. So I urge anyone, if you're even if you're not concerned about pricing, I think it's such valuable stuff in there. You know, particular one that I saw was about the bundling. Uh, and some there's some psychology in there about how people how people buy and all this kind of thing as well so it's absolutely amazing so i wanted to call out that as a way to get in touch with you but anything else that you want sure. you know other things for the you know other ways for people to get in touch with you please do yeah Let people know. So, well first of all thank you for your kind words that was lo- lovely to hear you know when you're posting on linkedin it's kind of like you're sending things out into the ether right and you like you get a sense of like okay how many people like this post but like you don't really know if they're just going by being like, 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 or like you don't know. So that was lovely to hear. Thank you. Um, I have a website, JanetBumpus.com. Um, and it's funny. So, uh, so I, you mentioned, right, I'm teaching this class on me. And this is a bit of a shift for me because I've always been, you might say, B2B, like a company hires me and I come in and work with their teams. Uh, this is a public class where anybody has it. So you kind of have to have a public presence. Um, so uh, for the first time in my life, I'm uh, building LinkedIn. Uh, so I would love it if anybody follows along. I have like a really small number of followers because like I've always, I've always been working under a B2B model where it's like, you know, relationship building with large companies or with startup founders. And, and, and so this is a, a new, new world for me. Um, and it's funny, I, like I, I tried to stay focused on, you know, product uh especially like the product managers like building products that customers love uh and so i'm like is pricing a complete diversion like i feel like i'm like i i do have a challenge in staying focused because there's so many interesting things out there but i do feel like it is product like it is a huge part of it and you use the same product principles to figure out your price like you're fig- you're running experiments you're doing all sorts of stuff so um, it's been really fun. Uh, and it's funny because it started out being like, oh, I'm teaching this Maven class, so I have to post on LinkedIn. Uh, and now I'm like so excited about p- posting on LinkedIn. I almost forget. I'm like, when is the Maven class? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you, you've got one cohort coming up on the 2nd of October and another one on 13th of November. Again, I will put those links down in the description for people anyway. So shouldn't be an issue a bit with 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 being uh, able to go directly to that just to comment on your your approach i think it is absolutely product and i think what you've done is you've applied your product thinking your product model to a pricing thing and it also makes me think about how many other things this kind of product model could be applied to within organizations as mm-hmm. well but that will definitely have to be saved for another conversation some other time. Um, and uh, so I'm now considering, um, I kind of like doing a series. Uh, so I was like, my next series, I'm either thinking on uh, product market fit or network effects. Do you have a vote? I love it. I would personally, oh man, that's a tough one. I, I think product market fit is like, that feels like the most, particularly for early stage, the most important question and yeah. most important thing that you're seeking. So um I, I would vote for that one first but i definitely right. want to see the network effects as well okay <laughs> all right one vote for product market fair fit first all right amazing well janet uh, again well, thank you so much for your time today it's been amazing to get to know you actually over the last couple of months as well and kind of understand well. how you yeah thank you um i absolutely recommend going and checking out janet's uh linkedin check out the course as well i think it's perfect for those you know uh, product managers, but also maybe founders or entrepreneurs that want to get more into understanding what the product world is, is all about as well. And I know there's a lot of people like that that listen as well. So um, huge thanks for your time. Keep on doing what you do. Yeah. Thank it you. It's clearly and, working. Oh, and everybody should do a product vision board with product sprint. <laughs> a product vision sprint. Storytelling. <laughs> Go do that. Amazing. Again, Janet, thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend. We are now at the weekend, um, but have a wonderful weekend. And uh, yeah, I cannot wait to speak again sometime on maybe a part two.